Welcome back to Climate Adaptation here on Simpatico. Today we have amazing special guests, a badass women in adaptation panel. And I'm going to hand this on over to Beth, who will be moderating this panel and starting the introductions. Have a wonderful time, y'all. Thank you, Kayla. Welcome, everybody, to Afternoon Tea with some badass adaptation women. I'm Beth Gibbons. I'm the Executive Director of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals. and for the next hour, we're inviting you into a conversation with women who are leading climate adaptation. And to be honest, this is a little bit for ourselves too. So on a regular basis, usually biannually, the Women of Adaptation will get together at the National Adaptation Forum. And to make decide it, these conversations that happen, what are you doing? What's changing? What are you leading? What are we going to cook up? How are we going to rock the field? And we're missing it. We're missing each other. We're missing a lot right now in this time. And so this is an opportunity for us to come together, to invite you in and to share a little bit about what's happening across our own organizations, our lives, the adaptation field and the communities that we're all serving. So to start us off, we're gonna do a round robin of introductions. I have the esteemed honor to introduce Rebecca Esselman. Um, Rebecca Esselman is the executive director of the Huron River Watershed Council, a leading organization taking care of the Huron River, which flows throughout Southeast Michigan, a place that she and I, and spoiler alert, Missy Stoltz, also all call home. Rebecca has been the ED of HRWC for the last several, well, within a year. Prior to that, she was with HRWC and she led a lot of their initial climate adaptation work. So she's been doing this work on the ground, building a program, getting in with communities, with dam operators, with natural resource managers, and really understanding what does adaptation look like when it's hands-on. Rebecca comes from a deep background in ecology, wetland, river care, and so she's really um, one of our birds and bunnies people here in the field, and I'm so glad that you're on the panel, Rebecca. <laughs> I think my kids would like that description. I'm a birds and bunnies person. <laughs> <laughs> I've never quite put it that way. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Um, yeah, and now it's my turn to introduce Missy Stoltz. Um, so I actually started courting Missy probably about 10 years ago when I first met her because <laughs> she's so exceptional. So we both ended up in Ann Arbor together uh, when she was doing her PhD program um, at the University of Michigan. I had probably not been at the Watershed Council too long and she was diving deep on climate adaptation, um, where the field was on adaptation planning uh, across the nation and how we could improve um, our approach to adaptation planning and get it into action fast since that what that is what this crisis uh, requires. Um, she proved herself to be just this rock star. Um, and because of that, uh, her and I have been trying to find ways to work together ever since. And, and I think we've done that pretty well across jobs and geographies and topics. Uh, we just find ways to work together and get things done. Um, most recently, Missy landed much to my um, joy in the Office of Sustainability, leading the Office of Sustainability at the city of Ann Arbor, which is in the watershed that, that I work to protect. So now we get to be partners in a very real way. And I just watched her over the last year complete this Herculean effort to uh, write a climate neutrality plan for the city of Ann Arbor, get incredible amounts in a very short amount of time of uh, public input and professional input, and then get this through a city council who had a lot of um, different ideas about what this should look like and if it could even be. So uh, she's had quite a year. We should all applaud her. <laughs> and that's Mitzi. 
Rebecca, I adore you. You too, Beth. Thank you so much. It's my great pleasure to introduce my pal, my gal, Jess Granis. Miss Jessica Granis is currently in a new role since December as the Coastal Resilience Director at the National Audubon Society, where she also is a Birds and Bunnies gal. And she'll tell you she spends a lot of time writing information and delivering that to Congress. And do they listen? You bet, because she's Jessica Granis, and you better listen to what she has to say. And if you're not, we should probably vote you out. That's all I have to say on that topic. Before she joined the National Audubon Society, uh, she spent 10 years at the Georgetown Climate Center, where she was leading numerous efforts to really advance adaptation uh, across states in particular, but also working with local uh, communities and, of course, federal agencies. Jess really is a star in the field. She is brilliant. She's smart. She's fun. And she makes us all better. So, Granis, over to you. Thanks, Missy. I also spent some significant time courting Missy in my early years in the field as well when she was at Ickley. But it's my pleasure to introduce someone that I have the privilege of calling my friend because she's lightness, little ray of sunshine at all times, Emily Wosley, or just Wosley as we like to call her. She is the Senior Project Director and Future Ready Advisor at WSP in San Francisco Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she leads WSP's corporate and climate risk and resilience work. Before she joined WSP, she was Director of Corporate Sustainability and Climate Resilience at the Cadmus Group. And before she left the DC area and left me for the San Francisco Bay Area, she was a Research Program Director at the US Global change research program where she helped to develop USGCRP's annual report to Congress on our changing climate. And she is a member of the ASAP board of directors and co-leads ASAP's personal resilience interest group. And she's the fabulous mom to Buddy, the adorable gray Muppet who gives me joy on my Instagram feed. <laughs> oh my gosh, Jess, I love you so much. Um, the fact that you got Buddy in there is huge, um, but thanks Jess. So, we always save the best for last, and I get to introduce Beth, who briefly introduced herself. Um, but Beth is truly who keeps us all in line and keeps us managed and is the executive director of ASAP. Um, in this role, I believe she's been in this role for about four years now, I want to say. Um, she's responsible for really helping uh, the, our members and professionals in the adaptation field truly understand um, and advance their ca uh, capacity and capabilities as it relates to adaptation. Um, she is such a joy to be around. I met her at a White House event in Washington, DC. Fun fact, she used to live in DC before she moved to Michigan, um, but she brings over a decade of experience in both sustainable de development and at climate adaptation. Uh, prior to joining the uh, as the ASAP executive director, she directed the U University of Michigan's Climate Change Center and managed NOAA's Great, Great Lakes Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment Center. Um, she has spent some time internationally um, in Togo where she served in the Peace Corps. Um, she has a master's of urban planning from U University of Michigan. And if any of you have known her, um, she, one of the first things that she mentions is she's a great lover of Ypsilanti and she is a, dedicated mom to three adorable kids um, and I don't know how she has the time but she also helps to really advance uh, personal resilience for both herself and everyone in the community. So Beth I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thanks Emily. Um, that was super sweet. I can't help but look over on my um, on my bookshelf because I still have the candy packets that they were giving out at the White House when we met because it was still the Obama White House and they had leftover Halloween packets and we were there for the graduation of an AmeriCorps team and it was I think it was the last Re Resilience AmeriCorps graduation that happened and, yeah. uh, and then I got lost on the White House grounds and that was <laughs> 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 and like, it, kind of it was, yeah. I was like, can I leave this way? I don't know. Did um, you have to get escorted out of certain hallways or something? No, it was. Anyway, <laughs> back to my tea. So, <laughs> let's dive right into it. Um, I know that we have some folks that are in new jobs. I know that everybody is just working like crazy. So, What's going on? Like, what's that project that is occupying you and bringing you hopefully joy right now? Um, what is it? And 
For those of you that are in new roles, going to call out Rebecca and Emily and Jess. Love to hear a little bit about your transitions and how's it going. Missy, you're going to go first because Rebecca already alluded to some serious accomplishments yeah. that you're driving in Ann Arbor, and I want to hear all about how you're feeling today. You bet. Uh, sorry, I was having a hard time finding the mute button. My bad. Uh, let's see. So the most exciting thing for us is we did adopt what's called A20. It's a carbon neutrality plan that outlines how we're going to achieve a just transition community-wide to carbon neutrality by the year 2030. It's audacious, but it's necessary when we look at the science, of course, of climate change. It's all community, um, and it's grounded in the principles of equity, justice, transformation, and sustainability, and we're really excited about it. One of the core tenets, of course, is resilience, um, as we all know intimately, and those on, uh, paying attention to this broadcast know. We we can't mitigate our way out of this problem. We have to have adaptation and mitigation. And at the local level, we really don't have the luxury of breaking these things apart. So a lot of the work that I do really focuses on the intersection of them. And just, uh, there were two exciting things I thought I would share. One is just for this audience, because it hasn't gone public yet, uh, the other has gone public. The one that has gone public is we have just uh, secured funding and are breaking ground any day now on our first resilience hub which is a community asset that uh, serves the community. It's activated by the community. They determine how to program it. And it'll also have features like renewable energy with battery storage and of course on site stormwater management and other features to make sure that in a disaster that site can still function for that neighborhood and that kind of community it draws from. So we're pretty excited about that project to move forward. Um, and we did secure some outside funding and then the city matched some resources for that. So that's pretty cool. And then the one that's totally crazy, because um, realistically, on Monday, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed by the world. And when I feel pretty overwhelmed by the world, I do what I imagine most of us do, which is come up with really big, crazy ideas that are not my job, but other things that someone else could do. And uh, I came up with an idea. And I got to do it. So here and now, I'm going to announce uh, we're about to launch a 10,000 tree campaign. So in the next year, we're going to take 10,000 trees locally in Ann Arbor. Uh, we're about to hire someone to come on board and move that forward. And it is part of our E20 plan. It was a plan um, that we thought we would implement this phase of it later. But we made the decision. Uh, this is the victory we want to have immediately. So here we go. Awesome. Nice, Missy. Congratulations. Um, I'm going to ask for you to segue to Rebecca a little bit because you and Rebecca and I all live in the same, we're in the Detroit metro region, but we're a region that really tends to kind of pivot around what Ann Arbor is doing. And so what's a little bit um, of like that regional implication then Rebecca, I'd love for you to like come in and talk about some of what A20 might mean for HRWC, but then just what else you have cooking up and how HRWC is continuing to drive your awesome on the ground adaptation work. Sweet question, Beth. So in terms of the coordination, one, our county just last week, Washtenaw County passed uh, a similar resolution that they're aiming to be carbon neutral by 2030. And so what happens, right, is, is the first kind of cookie crumbles, the rest follow suit. And so we're starting to see really a regional movement where Beth sits in Ypsilanti. Uh, they're a partner in our carbon neutrality work because climate impacts literally do not care about artificial geopolitical borders. Like it's a Did you hear Ann Arbor Township is considering the same too? Did it? That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, and nice. And for the programs that we're running, we are not talking our way. Right? We're doing solar programs, and if you know, I need to talk to you if you want to be a host about that. Very exciting stuff. Um, and then the Huron River Watershed Council, where Rebecca is fearlessly leading that organization and really great work, they're one of the partners in the carbon neutrality efforts because they understand, um, well, I should let her tell you why they're a partner, but they're a really <laughs> important partner in this work. And so, Rebecca. Sure. Yeah, you know, um, I think of the world in watersheds, right? Um, and and that allows me to think regionally and how we're all interconnected and it's a natural boundary rather than a political boundary, which um, I think is is useful in thinking about environmental change and and um, and communities. And you know this this carbon neutrality plan, um, a huge amount of it is focused on mitigation um, and doing our part uh, as a community to to slow climate change, but you, as uh, I think it was Missy said, you, you can't, we, that, we can't do that alone. We've got baked in change coming. We're already experiencing it. How do we adapt to our new climate and, and um, you know, uh, 
protect communities and prepare. And you know, one of the, one of the ways that I'm looking forward to working with Missy on this um, kind of builds off that ten thousand trees concept. So, for any kind of offset work, um, land protection has so many benefits um, to climate mitigation, and then to you know the biodiversity protection movement, which is what I you know came out of. Um, school uh, prepared to to tackle for my career um, and so we're and from a watershed perspective too um, you protect land you protect water the uh, river is only as healthy as the lands that surround it and you know development can happen haphazardly or can happen intentionally and by approaching development and land protection intentionally, we can really make progress on the climate issue. And as an added bonus, we protect water quality. And um, uh, one thing that folks may not know is that Ann Arbor gets its drinking water from the Huron River. So um, it's one of the few surface water sources of drinking water in Michigan. Uh, most people get from the Great Lakes or from groundwater. So we have this added motivation to make sure the Huron stays clean. It's 120,000 people uh, drink water from the Huron. So um, the better we can do source water protection um, together with the city of Ann Arbor uh, with their offset um, goals, then, um, you know, it's like a win, win, win. Uh oh, Bethy might be on mute. So. She is. Gosh, how embarrassing. How embarrassing. Basically, Rebecca, I love that you're at the home of HRWC because I love your climate passion and your knowledge. And then to have all that wrapped up in an organization that has as much influence as it does in our region, um, I just think it's a really exciting time for us. Thinking about regions, thinking about broad scale, Jess? You've looked at regional adaptation leadership quite a lot from your perch at Georgetown Climate Center. I know that's in the in the background now, but I'd love to hear like, what do regions need? What is happening at the federal level? Um, and I assume at Autobahn, you're fixing all of it now. Yeah, I'm fixing it, the bird. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think from a regional perspective, regions are super important. As Missy was saying, impacts aren't going to stop, stop at jurisdictional boundary lines that are artificial. And so the more we can get cities to work together and counties to work together, um, the quicker we can put measures into place at the pace and scale needed to address the magnitude of the challenge that we're all facing. And there's some really great regional work being supported by the um, you know, Institute for Sustainable Communities by in, in Southeast Florida, by local government commission in California has, I think, seven now regional collaboratives in some of the greater metropolitan regions. And these really help to share lessons across jurisdictions and bring climate science and funding to the ground for projects. Um, but, you know, at Audubon, a lot of my work now is focused on federal policy and learning from the efforts of our state offices to implement natural infrastructure and coastal resilience projects on the ground that benefit both communities as well as birds and, and other wildlife and use the lessons and challenges that they're facing um, designing, building, funding those kinds of projects to inform our federal policy advocacy and make sure that our federal agencies and federal programs are delivering uh, climate science information, funding, and the regulatory frameworks needed to help uh, communities and nonprofits like Audubon implement the projects that we need to reduce risks for communities. So just from an adaptation and resilience perspective, you know, there's so much noise out there right now in politics. Um, and we'll talk about more of that later in this in the segment. But if somebody were to really want to dig in to understand what is moving in a meaningful way in the federal policy landscape, where would you direct them? Um, I think the House Select Committee report on the climate 
crisis has a really mm -hmm. nice, it's not a summary, it's <laughs> words of 500 pages, um, but it's a really great synopsis of not only where they're looking to go in the next Congress, but also uh, summarizing the bills that have been put forward to mm -hmm. address climate risk um, and resilience and also the, the mitigation investments that we need to get the cause of climate change under control. Um, so I think that's a good summary of like what's happening on the Hill and what legislative proposals have been put forward. I'm wondering what you, if you could write a piece of legislation that you think would be the most impactful right now for the field, what would you push and what would you write? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Got that bomb Way to softball. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. she wouldn't have done it if Jess couldn't deliver. That's that's why Missy's not the moderator. <laughs> really putting me the test there. I mean, Adam is challenging because it's 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 everything. It touches everything, and so everything from the way that we permit development under the Clean Water Act to the way that we regulate development in floodplains under the National Flood Insurance Program all have a role to play in the risk and resilience of communities. And m most of those federal statutes have no reference or consideration to climate change. Um, so I don't know that it's going to be a silver bullet. There's not going to be one legislative vehicle that addresses all of the climate resilience challenges that we all need. Um, but there are good proposals out there to make sure that the climate, you know, we're monitoring and developing the climate science that decision makers need on the ground, that we're removing those regulatory barriers where they exist. And that when we're giving, you know, billions of dollars in federal investments that we're ensuring that people are building for the future and taking climate into consideration and using nature-based approaches that provide multiple benefits and try, instead of trying to like build shoreline armoring and seawalls that are environmentally harmful. Um, so it's all of the above strategy. Nice. Well, the good news I'd is there's on the call who's been working on the all of the above strategy. So Wasley, as was introduced in your intro, you previously was, were coordinating at the US Global Change Research Program for folks who don't know, that's an institution that's intended to coordinate science and climate science across all the government institutions. So Emily knows everything that is happening across all agencies at all times. Um, <laughs> since then, she's gone from- the I did? I did. <laughs> I don't know that a lot has changed since then, so. <laughs> Under the previous administration, yes. <laughs> but Emily, tell us some um, about what that means. I think that Emily, like, just just hit on this idea of like sound climate science and regulatory community and regulatory affairs. And now you're working on the private side and like this is an all hands on deck game. So like, what's the team that you're bringing? Because it's one that we desperately need. Sure, and I think as we've all kind of mentioned, we can't do this on our own. So the fact that um, I previously came from the federal agency space where there was a lot of coordination that was required um, to really better understand the existing science that was being invested in um, and how that was gonna be decision useful to a variety of different fo folks that um, use that science to take action. And so um, what I get to do now, and I work for a consulting company called WSP. Um, I work on the sustainability, energy, and climate change team, and I lead all of our corporate climate risk uh, and water risk and resilience work. So, you know, it's been a fascinating journey to go from federal government to um, true private sector and public, um, you know, publicly traded companies and supporting them. And, it's really, it's really getting to the heart of this decision useful and um, how to, and what I work with corporations to do um, is if they're making a commitment or they're setting a goal to be carbon negative or carbon neutral, what does that look like and how can that be done equitably? And what are the implications on uh, climate change, both positively and negatively? And then um, really what, can be done to enhance the resilience within the communities where they live and work. And, and that's, that's the best part of my job. And the fact that I get to 
work with really dedicated clients who are taking leadership roles in the space of climate adaptation, climate resilience, um, has been so much fun. And a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is working around the task force and climate related financial disclosures. And um, that for shorthand is TCFD, for those of you not familiar with it, it's a uh, framework that was founded in 2015 um, and launched officially in 2017. But a lot of uh, investors like BlackRock and State Street and others that hold a lot of uh, share in, and stake in major companies have been asking uh, for more transparency as it relates to sustainability, um, actions that are being taken, not just disclosing their data, but really disclosing progress. So that's in a nutshell kind of what I get to do um, and have been working with some really exciting clients in the financial space, in the IT space, um, in lodging and hotels. So I get to kind of do a mixture of everything, but I get to really share best practices across my clientele. Um, and really that is, I think, what they see as most valuable. So can you give us like a little insider information? Um, like what's the, what's the coolest thing that you've seen a company doing or taking up that you say to yourself, like, that's it. Like that is what I'm going to aspire to get everyone else to replicate. And, and it's going to influence beyond just the company boundaries, but actually to those communities where the companies sit and operate and distribute to. Yeah. I mean, a lot of my clients are doing really cutting edge things, but there's one in particular that has been setting um, setting the stage for a lot of different corporations to follow. And so, you know, setting goals to become carbon negative and really sequester that carbon from the air. So mm -hmm. the fact that we can't do adaptation without mitigation is really crucial. Um, yeah. And with that same client, we're able to, um, we've established a climate risk and resilience management program uh, where we have been working with the enterprise risk management group, um, the uh, business continuity planning folks, everyone within the environmental sustainability uh, component. And so really trying to embed climate considerations across the organization. And with that is, you know, comes the assessment of adaptive capacity. And so a lot of companies are really assessing their risks, um, but not truly understanding what their adaptive capacity is. And that's one component mm -hmm. of vulnerability. So um, right. I'm working with clients to, to go beyond that and, and get into that space. Awesome. I really appreciate that. And I think that we see that in essentially like all types of adaptation is like, it's one thing to know your vulnerabilities, but you have to know what your adaptive capacity is. And like telling an asset-based story versus a deficit model is something that mm -hmm. talking a lot about it at ASAP. And I'll just go ahead and get to take the mic for a second. Cause like my favorite thing that we've done recently here is to develop and to release a justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion statement. And for me, when I came to ASAP four years ago, it was like a breath of fresh air to get to talk about climate change explicitly. Because at University of Michigan, while that was what drove our work, we had very much a um, adaptation by stealth if that's how we had to do it. So we would do um, adaptation strategy, but not necessarily talk about climate change. At ASAP, we've always talked about climate change explicitly. And now that we have this JEDI statement, what it's enabled me to do as executive director is to really live into that and say that our work is going to pursue justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, but really look at racial justice as well as looking at climate change. And I love that. Um, and I think that when we framed it, it was about pursuing justice, is about pursuing um, equity, liberation, and those shared goals and like those shared joys, which is, I would say, a word that I actually learned to use from you, Emily, um, and have been applying into my work and applying into ASAP's work, I hope. Um, and so I really, I like that you're seeing that too in the corporate sector, because I think it's someplace that we all are trying to make sure that we're bringing our strengths to this conversation, not just having it be about our vulnerabilities and, and where the weaknesses are. Yeah, and I think building on that, I think honestly, the fact that we're all in the adapt space, adaptation space, we're all female, we are um, dedicated, we love people, we love communities, we love critters, we love all the animals, but the fact that we have the ability to weave in equity throughout everything that we do and we actively choose and select to do that and have been for a while um, is a real opportunity because you can't have resilience without equity. Um, and as we're seeing now, it's 
it's a huge issue that needs to be addressed. And obviously it doesn't happen overnight, but I think there are ways, there are co-benefits of solutions that we're providing that can also help with equity and injustice. And Beth, one thing that I've reflected on recently too is we started our carbon neutrality journey before COVID, right? And we made the explicit choice to ground all the work in equity and justice at the beginning. And for some people that was really eyebrow raising, um, especially for kind of people who are traditionally coming from an environmental background where they're sort of like, well, this is the goal, right? The goal is emissions reductions. The goal is this many lives saved, whatever it may be. And so bringing equity into the fore was really, really important. And for some people a little uncomfortable, but I can guarantee that when we brought a plan forward in COVID, in the midst of it, a billion dollar plan forward, there was no way in this world that plan would have passed if equity and justice weren't at the core of it. Right, because we were at a moment, and I hope that we really truly are at this moment where society is becoming more woke in terms of systemic racism, in terms of the intersectionality of COVID and climate change and racism and injustice and many of these other issues that I, I know we're kind of uh, scratching at the surface to talk about. But I just wanted to identify that it's not lost on me, that had we not done that, we would have lost uh, the fight and we would have lost the fight on two folds. We would have lost the policy fight and we would have actually lost purpose in terms of what we're actually fighting for. Yeah, yeah, definitely hear that. Like, so similarly with ASAP developing that Jedi statement when we did, it was in development for a long time and it was formally passed on April 20th. So in June, when we began to see the social uprisings and started to see people um, protesting in the streets, protesting the death of George Floyd and the murder of Breonna Taylor. Like we had this statement that we were able to release a solidarity statement to feel really out oh, and know had something and that member, you should be tying your work to these principles already. And we were able to speak to our membership from an authentic place because we had it there. And so I think that like um, part of my work has been um, focusing on where we are versus where, like, where I could have been by now or where I have to go. But I think that starting the work now is always, you know, like, it's like the tree planting. When was the best time? 20 years ago. When's the next best time? Right now. Start your work. And then when these moments arise, like you as an individual and as an organization, hopefully as a society, like, we're going to be there and be able to respond. Um, yeah. Great outro, frankly, but we still got 30 minutes left. So let's <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, you asked a question earlier, uh, Beth, about the transition to the new job, right? So I spent yeah. eight years in, in this small environmental nonprofit. I was brought on um, explicitly to consider how climate change like, should affect how we do fresh water protection, river protection. And so at the, you know, at the time there was like this growing acknowledgement that we couldn't do what we've always done for natural resource protection. We've got this new context, we've got this growing threat. Um, what do we need to do different? And I spent, you know, eight years in that space and, you know, but I was a single staff person of 13 of us and, you know, I kind of did our climate work. Um, and that's not to say that it didn't make it into our other programs and projects, but but not not as a matter of course. Um, it really was sort of my niche within the organization. And so and there was kind of like two platforms I ran on to try to land this job. And one of them was mainstreaming climate adaptation into all of our programming. And the other was diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And just acknowledging that these things Natural resource protection can't happen in the absence of considering climate uh, um, or diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, and and that those two things need to be woven into the fabric of what we're doing if we're going to do it right, um, and if we're going to be successful. So, what's exciting to me about this position is that I get to um, really uh, dive deep on this stuff and start doing that weaving. And you know, we've had a great year so far, uh, especially on, on the diversity, equity, and inclusion front. And uh, we're really starting to dive in on the climate work as well, um, making sure that we're always asking that question with whatever grant proposal we're putting out there, whatever project idea we're thinking, like, you know, when we sit there and devise strategies to, to protect this river, that it's not happening outside of the context of the real world and, and issues that need to be addressed. And it's been fun. 
it's been rewarding. Nice. So, oh no, oh good. Emily, you faded out for a second, but you're back. Um, so something that comes up quite a bit and is one of the focus for this group, we're calling it Women in Resilience, afternoon tea with some badass adaptation leaders. Um, and we wanted to make sure we were making the point that these badass women are leaders. Um, and <laughs> there'll be future conversations with other women who are also leaders, who are emerging leaders, who are maybe like kind of the senior group up there. Like, I don't know who that is. Like, I don't know if anyone's graduated out of doing this work. I think you have to do it till you die once you start. <laughs> but um, let's talk a little bit about um, women and adaptation and why this pathway feels like it has attracted so many women, so many powerful um, and, you know, amazing women specifically. And Emily, like kick us off because you kind of, you went around the horn on job stuff. And so it starts mm -hmm. off in the women and women as leaders here. Sure, and I think we touched on this uh, briefly right before the session started, but I think, you know, I started my career in adaptation working at the intersection of climate change and national security. And that is traditionally a very male dominated space, um, especially the national security component. Um, but, you know, I think, I think there are so many uh, women, great women leaders who are so supportive of one another in this space because we want to see everyone succeed. We are doing it for the betterment of society and for our planet. Um, and we have, you know, a lot of us have really empathic souls. And so I think because we work well with communities, we work well with people, um, you know, that's a really important trait uh, to be in this space and to be humble and to be behind the scenes, not necessary, not always wanting to get recognition. Um, you know, I think that is a really important aspect of female leadership is that we just want to do good stuff um, and we don't necessarily want to take the credit for it. So I think that that would be my perspective, but would love to hear others. I was just having this thought about the empathy remark um, and getting back to like what this group of five does for each other and the, the group's broader than this too, but um, Beth talked about this national adaptation form, which is this amazing convening. Um, it's happened four years now, last eight years. Um, and it is a really intense four days for everyone involved. I mean, it, there's no good news. I mean, there is good news, but you know, we're eight years into this and there's a lot of bad news and there's a lot of like, there's so much more work to be done so much faster. Um, all the barriers, um, all the challenges. And we get to the end of those four days and we're all just like, oh my God, you know, exhausted, um, a little weary, a little bit, um, um, you know, we need a little lifting up. And so we've, we've made this habit of um, retreating after and like spending time together, just uh, letting ourselves be in that space, um, recover um, and kind of, you know, um, get ready to roll up our sleeves, take everything we've learned, all the relationships we've built and reconnected and, and, and go back and get to work. But it really does take time as an empath to, to uh, you have to intentionally recover or you get burned out. I think that's so valuable. And I mean, our last gathering, I was the breakdown case, I think in, in most situations. Like I was, I was very much feeling the weight of the field and these ladies received it and let me be uh, who I was in that moment and to feel. And I think the space, it's really rare. As much as you may love whoever's in your life and your partner, unless they do what you do, they, there are very few people who truly understand, I think the emotional burden some of us bear in this work and the, the work, really like really understand the work. And so to be with people who do and who, un, and who allow you to be raw and honest and just listen, and then can actually help you find solutions or work through it a little bit because they know it is really invaluable. And I think that's one of the most precious things that I get with these ladies. And we laugh <laughs> a lot. And there's a lot of ladies. Sometimes too much, but Sometimes you know. that's not a thing that can happen. Um, it's really, really great. 
So I really, I just wanted to elevate that. And then the last thing I'd add is to the question about why women, we were talking about this before. And I was reflecting on when I came into the field, I came into a nonprofit that was all young folks who had very little experience because no one really had experience in adaptation. And it was at a nonprofit called ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability. And we were helping communities do the very first adaptation plans, but we were also doing mitigation work. And what I noticed still with the national conversation was adaptation was defeat, right? You know, it's sure. 15, 20 years ago, but people really doubled down on mitigation and it was masculine work, it was hard work, it was robust, it was building solutions and things. And I agree with that and that's necessary. But the adaptation space, people thought that was so defeatist that it was kind of relegated to second class work. And I saw a lot of people who are natural caregivers step into that space and not be concerned what people thought, but to acknowledge that these people are already hurting. These people are already experiencing climate impacts. Our ecosystems are already being affected. We have to be honest and real about this. And what I've seen happen is most of those, those leaders have been women and they've pivoted the discussion from adaptation to this concept of resilience. This concept of resilience that really grounds mitigation, adaptation, and equity at its core. And that's you know the kind of leaders I see when I look at you all on this panel. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much puppy anymore, my gosh. Oh. Hey guys. Um, so we have a question from Doug, who I think it's like technically his show that we act so we'll let it we'll let it come in because it's a pretty good one um besides your badass selves do each of you have an adaptation woman you consider adaptation women women you consider leaders in the field any mentor figures i think we get this question a lot honestly and i think um several of us have relayed to beth that we would love to see more um, leaders that have been in this space longer than we have. Um, but in terms of that that focus, um, I have a couple. One is Judge Alice Hill. She's just been a go-getter, um, formerly with the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, she just is, she doesn't take no for an answer. And I love that about her. Um, and Another woman that I've been so grateful to be able to work with more closely recently is um, Kathy Jacobs. And she has been um, in all of our lives one way or another. And, um, you know, just, I got to work with her when she was at the White House and I was at US School for Change Research Program and continue to be able to find active projects to work with her. One particular one is um, with water utilities and really mapping exposure to climate related risks and identifying key solutions and opportunities for mainstreaming resilience. Yep. One of your grannis. I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, so Vicky Arroyo was a huge mentor through me for, to me for, throughout my career and really helped, um, helped me get started in this space and take a leadership role at Georgetown. Um, but I also would be remiss to not mention mm -hmm. our friend and colleague, Steve Adams, who's not a lady, but he's an honorary mm -hmm. member of our coven. Um, who, when we first started in this field, it was always like six degrees of <laughs> so separation true. from Steve Adams, who and just spent so much time on the phone sort of mentoring me and connecting me with people and just so generous with his time and spirit. And um, he's a true leader that I cherish in this space. Yeah. Yes, we are truly not a hater of men and men are allies. We see them as great partners. So we love them. We even let Jeremy come to dinner at our last weekend. We, oh, did. we did. That's right. right. We That's did. Right. You know, it's and, not an And he should be very grateful that that was an opportunity <laughs> we gave him. Yeah. But do we do we have to ask him to leave? Like, okay, time's we did. up. We did. I think we did. <laughs> it's girl time now. You can come yes. for a little while. But... Yes. And there's something with the flip flops in the grass that, like, you're trying to explain Emily. And it's like, oh, you put these grass flip flops. And I was like, okay, too much. Back to the cabin. Yeah. We must right. retreat. From the leader's perspective, I wrote down Kathy Jacobs as well. Um, Kathy's fearless. She's ferocious and she cares so deeply and passionately. And then a very different approach um, would be Rosina Beerbaum. For mm -hmm. me, she was my PhD advisor. She was one of the science advisors to President Obama. And she 
um, she'll kill you with kindness and she'll remember <laughs> things and she gets things done. She uh, still sends me notes on my daughter's birthday. Like she remembers things Aww. and she just keeps people at the center of the work. She's also cloned. I'm confident. Like, <laughs> no <one> <laughs> That's real. Nice. Um, I've been taking, I've been trying to take more lessons from Jackie Patterson, who serves on our board right now, um, in pursuing liberation, so like that joy perspective. And I mean, each of you have informed my work in immense ways, but um, really thinking about like not not pursuing this work or the or the equity work um, with sorrow or like not being over somber about it, but like finding those points of joy and like knowing that in achieving this, we achieve something for all of us and all of our communities um, has been, I, I actually have a, like, I have a date with her for her to give me more, like, what is liberation? And like, how do you pursue that jointly? And I'm really deeply, deeply grateful for the time she's put into um, ASAP's development and my development more recently. Rebecca, do you want to swing um, to you and hear about mentors and leaders and then also like kind of segue into what does that mean for you right now um, as we're all in a time under a lot of stress and like so what's kind of lifting you up and keeping you going through COVID-19 and and the rest of, I'll stop, the rest of it. <laughs> Um, you know, I was like chewing on that mentor question while all of you were coming up with great responses. And, you know, what's, what's interesting about my, um, where I sit in this field, it's, um, you know, I, I haven't worked with other climate adaptation professionals in, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so my networks come through NAF. Uh, the, for, through the National Adaptation Forum. Um, in Michigan, we have uh, regular meetings of the Michigan Climate Coalition, which are professionals throughout the state that are focused on adaptation, um, primarily natural resource, but also public health. Um, that's another kind of informal adaptation network of mine. Um, but sometimes I feel like a little on my own. Um, and, you know, two of my uh, the people that I bounce around the most ideas with and learn from are, are sitting on this panel. So, you know, Missy and Beth are my kind of adaptation colleagues that are kind of most accessible and, and nearest to me and really help me um, feel less isolated uh, from where I sit. So, they're right here, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Um, so, I, you know, we'd be remiss to not talk about really explicitly the moment that we're in. Um, I obviously think we've been touching on this because that is the reality of our work. It is rooted in justice. It is rooted in where we are today. It is not shying away from enormous challenges. Um, but we have really been layering on the challenges, it feels like, in 2020. Um, so how are you doing? You know, if I like, like, how are we doing? How are, who wants to start? Where are you? And, um, yeah. I highly Good recommend to make a puppy. Puppies are helpful. <laughs> and I've yeah. been up canoeing and bird watching. So getting out in nature is essential and escaping this cold, dark basement that I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I would second that. I had to, I mean, I I don't have children, but I have a niece and nephew. And so I find myself in the times of COVID just working and sleeping. And I really had to um I took a two week staycation from work where I did not log in. I took work email off my phone. I had to recharge um, because it, it was a lot. And so I feel definitely recharged. And we, we always have this, you know, kind of perspective that we can't fill other people's cups if our, our cup is empty. And so um, we always try to encourage folks to really take a break, go outside in nature, 
Um, but sometimes it's easier said than done. So I think um, I really needed to get back on track and um, not be so hard on myself too <laughs> about the fact that I needed to change the world and, and you know, I could do that on my own. But um, yeah, I, I think getting out of nature and puppies, my parents just got a puppy. He's the cutest. I have my little <laughs> Muppet buddy. So all the animals help. You know, there's like staggering statistics right now about the increase in outdoor recreation that's happening in this country. Um, you know, uh, as part of the Huron River Water Trail Council, we run, we manage the Huron River Water Trail and the amount of, it, it was already a pretty heavy trafficked water trail, but it's, it's really off the charts, which, you know, is a blessing and a curse, but it just speaks to, um, you know, people's, we, we, we started hashtagging na nature is open because it is one of the few spaces that you can still go and kind of feel safe and, and um, enjoy yourself and, and re-energize. Um, and yeah, like there's, there's been a national shortage of canoes and kayaks. Um, and we joke on our staff calls, like what's going to be the next scarcity item. And here's, here's my theory. We'll see if this is correct. But I feel like at least for those of us in the Northern latitudes, like right now you should buy those outdoor, um, heaters that they have like at restaurants so that we can yeah. like, stay outside a little bit longer, right? Like winter's kind of scary. So everybody needs to order your outdoor heater before the nation runs out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Extend that outdoor time. The question you mentioned, though, Beth, about joy and like what, uh, I don't know, I was reflecting on this a little bit and, and where where it can come from uh, at a time like this or what, what gives us hope. Um, so much is unraveling and it, it's really uncomfortable and it's uh, super impactful and deadly to some and heartbreaking in some circumstances. And at the same time, it is forcing us to reimagine what could be, right? Mm -hmm. So there is this opportunity when everything's falling apart to think about how we're going to pick it back up. And is it going to look just like it did? Or um, is there something better? And so um, my hope comes from, you know, the entire country, country, the entire planet being thrown into this space of having to um, let go of what was and to think about what could be. And maybe, just maybe, it's a, um, a unique point in history that can allow us to catapult forward rather than this incremental, much too slow deconstruction and reconstruction of the way we live with each other and with the planet. Mm -hmm. I think that's really hopeful. And there are times that I can get in that place, but I will go the other side and say, I have lived in a, a place of pretty, uh, a pretty dark place for a little while. Nothing's wrong, friends, we're gonna be fine. But the reality of caregiving, right? And we talked about how adaptation professionals by default, like we tend to be caregivers like we think and we're empaths and this moment is showing how much we devalue it and how our schools play a really important role in caregiving and as those schools go virtual a lot of us you know those of us with with dependents in any way shape or form are really struggling with what that looks like and that burden is disproportionately falling on females and that means people i know people leaving the workforce because they don't know how else to handle it we talk mm -hmm game about flexibility and really respecting dependents um, and those who have dependent care responsibilities, but we don't do it. Um, expectations, sure, we're setting them on ourselves, but our supervisors are also setting those expectations. And one of the things when COVID hit that I, I'm reflecting on, so I'm like processing this in real time here, we didn't know how to support our essential workers who had dependents. No one knew what to do. What do you do when all the centers close? But you have police and fire officers that there are firefighters that have to go out on the streets or we still have to pick up garbage. But, you know, people are really scared about where they're going to send their dependents. And so do you know whose job that became? It became my job because no one else took it. Right. And so that is what I move forward as well as our carbon neutrality work with how are we going to take care of our people? And that's really the pivot that I'm in right now as schools are going virtual. You know, almost a third of all of our city staff have dependents. And 
not insignificant number of them are talking about taking their rightful, you know, time off due to the CARES Act. And then some of them are talking about leaving the workforce. We can't perform our jobs and protect the public health, safety, and general welfare if we don't have people doing that work. But I can't ask people to do that work when they can't be there. And so how are we finding that balance? And I think a lot of this to me, there's a, it's not lost in me the reason that I picked that up. Right. Like it's the same reason that we do the work that we do because we care really deeply about these systems. And so I think it's I think it's honest. I think it's honest to say that this is really, really hard. Mm-hmm. And it is, Rebecca, to your point, a time to reflect and really challenge the status quo and to be different and do different. And it's okay to acknowledge that this is still really hard, really hard. And unprecedented. I mean, truly, if this hasn't something of this magnitude and scale and and people will keep asking me, you know, how can you compare COVID and climate change? And what are the similarities and what are the differences? And, you know, they're both global issues that require global response and really affect people at the local scale. And so um, it's just, it's, you know, my niece and nephew are here at my parents' house. I'm here taking care of them um, and my niece and nephew while my sister has a break, but it's, you know, their lives are going to be forever changed. And so how do we set them up for success to help them understand that these times, however challenging and however hard, can help them grow in the future? And and what can, what what are those those sparks of joy or those sparks of growth that we can really leverage and and build upon that can keep us moving forward? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I I fall like I go I vacillate between where Missy is and where I'm or and where Rebecca is and like I think that there's a window of opportunity that's open right now and I hope that we will seize it to make really transformative change because those windows of opportunity don't come that often um, and I fear that we won't because we have worked in this because we have adopted this field we have adopted adaptation as our field because. Um, because of the failure to mitigate. And be, because of that, we have looked at it into the face of like failed, failure to act and said that something needs to be done. Um, I, take, I take heart in the people that I work with and the people that I love. Um, and I take a lot of heart that the people that I love are often people that I work with and that's awesome. <laughs> We're lucky, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were talking about like the retreat weekend and I go back a better whole family member to my, to my, to my kids and to my, to my best friend, my spouse, like because of that weekend, like it's, it's a bonus, but like it heals me and it allows me to go home and be fuller there. And I love that. Um, and so I yeah, what <laughs> one of my most favorite memories is all of us sitting at the airport ready to go home. We were somewhat more relaxed, I think, given the fact that we had spent the weekend together and laughed and giggled and and cried and all the things. Um, And we were sitting at the airport and we had, I think, 30 minutes and we're like, okay, let's sit down. Let's figure this climate stuff out. Go. And I think Missy captured some really kind of, yeah, yeah, on a (laughs) napkin or something. And it was just so and then I well you know that's okay i think a lot of us are doing the things that we promised that we would do or that we would want to take forward and it's just that gives me so much hope is working with you all connecting with you all on a regular basis and knowing that we're all individually doing what, the best that we can and we like you know not enough but we get to come together on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis um to really kind of reconnect and and share progress so I love you all. <laughs> I love you too, Waz. Thanks for getting this together for us. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta do it again. <laughs>